Hello, I'm Ben, and I'm here to talk to you today about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And that is a mouthful, so I might just refer to it here as psychedelics. But I specifically want to describe to you how psychedelic therapy can be instrumental in healing childhood trauma, healing our relationships with others and with ourselves. And for those of you watching this in an academic setting, my imposter syndrome tells me that I have no business giving anybody a, an academic talk, so I'm going to rely on my bachelor's degree in drama and hide some education inside my own personal story. So I was raised in a born-again fundamentalist Christian cult. In fact, last year, Amazon Prime released this four-episode docuseries about the cult that I was raised in called Shiny Happy People. Check it out. It's wild. So by order of the cult's leader, I was homeschooled from the third grade on so that my parents could prevent public school system's new humanistic education curriculum from brainwashing me and my brothers into witches and homosexuals. For real. So here I am, gay as a goose, a humanistic psychologist working under the supervision of a pagan priestess and I'm here speaking to you in promotion of psychedelic drug use. <laughs> Apparently, my parents did not understand reverse psychology. But for real, I was a little gay boy growing up in an environment where gay people were not only viewed as disgusting, but they were literally demonized. It was a spiritually traumatic childhood, to say the least. And today, I'm a 41-year-old therapist living here in the Detroit area. But once upon a time, I was a four-year-old boy. And one day, I found myself daydreaming, playing with my toys inside of my closet in my bedroom. And in that closet, I found my penis. An instinct led me to do what comes naturally. And in the moment of orgasm, my whole world changed. My body exploded into a new dimension of sensational reality. I had no idea what had just happened to me, but in that action of ecstasy, there was an equal and opposite reaction of deep, crushing shame. I knew I could tell no one what I had just experienced because the word sex and penis might have, well, they might as well have been four-letter words in our home. And believe me, four-letter words were never once uttered there, at least not in front of my parents. So when I was nine, the nine-year-old kid down the street began to groom and sexually abuse me. And because of my ongoing relationship with my own penis, part of me was intrigued by what he was doing. But the overwhelming feeling was fear and shame. So I was terrified because we were sinning big time. And if we got caught, I knew at the age of nine that sex between two boys was the worst thing anyone could do. I knew this because back around the age of five, um, I was daydreaming again, pondering the nature of reality, getting myself into trouble. And I had a confusing thought. So I sought clarity from my mother, who was this very sweet, jolly, creative, very wise woman, pleasantly plump, as we would sometimes call her, if we mentioned her weight at all. Um, her doctors called her morbidly obese, but we certainly never talked about that. So I asked, Mom, I know that when a man loves a woman, they get married and have babies. But what happens when a man loves another man? My mother stopped her mopping in its tracks, and she looked down at me, and with red in her eyes, she said, that is called homosexuality, and it's a sin. Just like that. <laughs> sin pierced me with the point she was trying to get across. So when my neighbor started to abuse me at the age of nine, it caused a crack in my mind. And my mind shattered one evening before Wednesday night church service, when up in his attic, 
My neighbor crossed a sexual line that I swore I would never cross with him. I panicked and I ran out of his attic in tears. I rushed out onto his front lawn, frantically scanning the terrain. I felt completely exposed under the big sky. My breath was labored as I walked home and I frantically dried the tears from my eyes. I was dreading going to church that night because in my nine-year-old mind, in that moment, I had lost my soul. And I knew I could never tell anyone what had happened. And so I became isolated inside of that secret. And I tried to run as far away from that experience as I could, from the terror of hell and the shame of that secret. My mind left that terrified nine-year-old little me in the dust. See, I had learned how to stuff my emotions down. Growing up, any negative emotion was considered a spiritual failing. Shiny, happy people. I was allowed to laugh, and I found solace and humor, but fear, sadness, anger, not allowed. So after that day in the attic, I started to dissociate and dream of a life far, far away where I would be loved and accepted for who I was. So cut to, I'm in my early 20s, having moved to Los Angeles to become a famous and beloved actor. But I had a problem. I could not cry. Not only could I not cry when I needed to for a role, but I never cried in my real life. I took a lot of acting classes to try to fix this problem, but I still could not access the emotional depth that I knew had to be there. Because after all, I was deeply empathetic. I could cry for other people's sadness, just not my own. So I realized that what I really needed was therapy. And so I didn't get any at the time, of course. But I did come across a book about the power of positive thinking. And it was very helpful. And then an acting teacher suggested that I listen to some recorded lectures on A Course in Miracles, which is a book that describes itself as a form of spiritual psychotherapy that is self-taught. So I put the CD in the CD player and press play. And as the lecturer opened, she said a prayer. And as soon as she mentioned the word God, I gagged and immediately turned it off. So one day, when I was 23, I was in my room, daydreaming, getting myself into trouble, and I decided to smoke some marijuana alone, something I had never done before. And as the drug took effect, I started to become viscerally aware of my physical body. Looking back now, having had all the therapist training that I've had, I understand that until that point, I had been using my mind to escape my body. So there I am, stoned in my body, and I became keenly aware that I am a mortal creature. My body is just a machine that is functioning right now, but eventually it is going to stop and I will die. My 23-year-old sense of invincibility vanished and all of my repressed childhood programming around hellfire and brimstone that I had thrown out came rushing back into my consciousness. My heart started to pound and I became convinced I was going to die right then. I was high and this was real. So I fell into the first and only panic attack I've ever had. In terror, I stumbled outside onto my balcony where all I could see was the sun shining through the tops of the palm trees, dancing in the warm air. And as the sun warmed my bare chest, The sights and sounds and sensations triggered what the father of humanistic psychology, Abraham Maslow, called a peak mystical experience. 
there's a scale often used in psychedelic therapy research called the mystical experience questionnaire. And it contains 30 items like experienced unity with ultimate reality and experienced the insight that all is one. And the feeling that it would be difficult to communicate your own experience to others who have not had similar experiences. Well, I recently took that score, uh, took that questionnaire and I scored 140 out of 150. It's a score that the questionnaire calls extreme. Here's a photo that I took from that balcony on another day, but you get the picture. In that moment, a truth new to me became so clear and so complete. In his 1902 book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, philosopher and psychologist William James calls it a noetic sense, or that it seems to convey insights into depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. Journalist Michael Pollan says it simply, says it's a sense that it's a revealed truth, not an opinion. So it felt like I received a download of cosmic information and it reprogrammed my mind in an instant. The word God was redefined in my mind as all that is. It's the energy that runs the universe, the energy that shines the sun, blows the air, spins the atoms, and beats my heart. Even my mind is made of it. And there's no separation between it and me and you and everything else. And because I was back in my body so profoundly, I could sense this like something that I could smell or touch or see. I truly felt sense of the interconnected, interdependent oneness of all things. A universal sense of peace and indescribable cosmic energy, which I can only describe as unconditional love, overwhelmed me. And simultaneously, I lost all fear of death, which has lasted. And I'm in no rush to test that out, but it has lasted. The whole thing sounds cliche, but it healed my spiritual trauma. I could go on and on and on about it. So now that God no longer made me gag, I went back to that recorded lecture on A Course in Miracles and I let it play. And the lecturer went on to speak in language that perfectly matched my experience. And to my amazement, I began to discover that countless other people across cultures and throughout the ages have had similar experiences. And so there started my spiritual journey. After that day on the balcony, after that awakening, I started to lose interest in acting. And I felt called to share with others more directly the gift that I had been given that day. And it took me 12 years of ups and downs and fits and starts wandering the wilderness. But I finally surrendered to the call about six years ago and I went back to school to become a therapist. I always knew that my therapeutic stance would be centered in that mystical experience I had at the age of 23. Because I knew that if I could sit grounded in a place of peace during another person's emotional storm, then I could be an anchor for them as they find their way out of that psychic turbulence. So several years ago, I heard that psychedelics were being used in psychotherapy. And so I made it my mission to join the movement, knowing just from firsthand experience, just, as, just how uh, transformative these, these experiences and these medicines can be. So last October, uh, just of last year, I completed a year-long training program in uh, Boulder, Colorado, to become a certified psychedelic assisted therapy provider. And during that training, I had personal medicine experiences with ketamine, with ayahuasca, and psilocybin magic mushrooms. So ayahuasca 
is a powerful psychedelic brew made from a combination of plants found in the jungles of South America. And an ayahuasca ceremony feels much more like a religious or spiritual ritual than it does a therapy session. Integration, or I should say intention setting, is a, an important part of psychedelic healing. My intention for ayahuasca was to find clarity and freedom and to allow comfort from others. In the months leading up to this ceremony, I had realized that my unofficial mantra in life had always been, I'm fine, how are you? So after drinking the first cup of medicine, I writhed in discomfort while the 20 other participants spaced less than six inches from one another, vomited into buckets, moaned and cried and laughed. And the shaman then started to sing and play the most beautiful music I'd ever heard. I looked up into the dark room and the walls and everything else in the room became transparent. The night sky was now inside the lodge. All the stars in the galaxy flew into the dark room and swirled with multicolored light. I could feel the night air blowing through my transparent body, through my skeleton, and then I transformed into a bird. I had asked for clarity, and everything literally became clear, like see-through. <laughs> it was ecstatic. And then the shaman walked into the middle of the room and blew uh, some dust from his hand. And in that moment, my body blew away into a cloud of stardust into a rainbow galaxy. Mama Ayahuasca, as she's referred to by some, is considered by certain indigenous tribes to be the consciousness of Mother Earth herself. And she was reminding me of what I had become so viscerally aware during my experience nearly 20 years prior with cannabis. We're all just stardust and everything is going to be okay. She reminded me of heaven as preparation to take me to hell. So up until this point in the night, I had not vomited, or as it's referred to in the medicine circle, purged. So when that second dose hit, I could feel my mind twist and my stomach turn. I was terrified to vomit in a, in a room full of people. So I ran downstairs into the bathroom, to the bathroom, which was occupied, of course, and I could not hold it. So I sat on the floor and hurled violently into my bucket. And then a man burst out of the bathroom, looked at me on the floor, had this look of horror on his face as he ran past. And I ran into the bathroom behind him. My body was telling me, you're dying. Get this poison out of your body right now. And my mouth and my nose filled with stomach acid and bile. And once the vomiting finished, I could not get rid of that disgusting smell. It followed me out of the bathroom, and no matter where I walked to escape it, that disgust followed me. I became entirely convinced that the reason the others were vomiting and moaning and writhing in pain was because of my mere presence in the building. Over the next hour or so, the medicine spiraled me into the depths of self-disgust. I could feel a cancer eating my guts and I was sure that the others could smell it leaking out of my orifices. I stepped out into the balcony, hoping that the wind would cleanse me of the smell. And as I stepped out, an old woman was being helped back inside and she was coughing, covering her mouth. But as we crossed paths, what I saw was her gagging at the sight of me. She was desperate to get away. And there was nothing I could do to escape myself. Soon, one of the facilitators they called guardians spotted me in my distress and reassured me that I did not smell. I was not stinking up the place, and he insisted I go back and lie down on my mat. Where well, I did, and I slowly came back to my senses. Mama Ayahuasca showed me 
the wound. It's a little boy deep inside who sees himself as disgusting, unlovable, and if his truth was known, he would be rejected. When shame consumes us, especially as children, a loving embrace in that darkest moment is the antidote because it rewrites the story, provides a corrective emotional experience, as we say in therapy. Fleeing the attic that day at nine years old, I needed to be seen, noticed, soothed, held, loved, told I'm not disgusting. But the shame of what I had just participated in trapped me in a secret and kept me from seeking the comfort I so desperately needed. This trappedness and emotional overwhelm inside that trappedness are the key qualities that make a memory traumatic. And the result of trauma is all too often shame planted deeply into our minds. And for many of us, this defines the trauma of growing up gay. It's the trauma of self-revulsion. So painful that our minds flee from it swiftly and at all costs. I tried to outrun it by proving my worth with perfectionism, numbing the pain with sex and drugs, and simply forgetting huge portions of my story. I realize now I sought fame so that others would love me without knowing anything about me. But in doing all of this, I left that terrified nine-year-old me frozen in time. Mama Aya forced me to sit in that unbearable anguish, defenseless, and face him. She whispered, he's still there waiting for you. Now bring him home. Six months after that ayahuasca ceremony, just last October, I flew to Oregon to participate in what I understand to be one of the first government approved and regulated experiential training programs ever conducted in the US to become a licensed psilocybin facilitator. Feels historic. The time between ayahuasca and the psilocybin training was an emotional roller coaster. I briefly relapsed that summer after four years of sobriety. I won the lottery. The lottery to get into the internal family systems therapist training program, level one, anyone? Anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but through that IFS training program, I explored the shadows of my unconscious. I restarted a relationship with my boyfriend, Will, understanding now so much more deeply the trauma that I had, uh, that had been instrumental in breaking us up 12 year, uh, months prior. At the time of our split, the best I could do to articulate why I was leaving him was intimacy issues. And these issues disguise themselves as disinterest, listlessness, pickiness, coldness, aloofness, and a wandering eye. But the bigger problem was that outside of the sexual act itself, which for me had always been used as a dissociative drug, physical affection and closeness had always been damn near excruciating for me. And I have learned over the years that that does not work so well in romantic relationships. But with IFS therapy training and therapy, uh, I was better able to see the different parts of myself working to protect me by keeping romantic partners at arm's length away from that stinking rot exiled deep inside me. So I was deeply unsettled going into this uh, mushroom practicum. I knew that my cure was to allow comfort during a time of suffering. But in order to do that, I must allow myself to suffer and to be seen by another person doing it. No, thank you. So as the therapist pairings for the training were announced, I was looking across the circle at Matthew praying under my breath, please say Matthew, please say Matthew, please say Matthew. And my prayer was answered. He was the only other gay man at the training and he was entering his 50s 
hoping to find clarity on his role as a gay elder, a role that is, to say the least, not well-defined and certainly not celebrated in the gay community. But Matthew's medicine journey was ecstatic. I sat with him quietly and held his hand when he asked for it, as we were trained to do. And I did my best to respond to his interactions with me with reflective, non-directive feedback. And it was a sweet and gentle five hours. Afterward, he told me that the mushrooms transformed him into Gandalf the White and revealed to him his profound value and inner power, which would transcend youth and beauty. It was a great comfort to him. And to my comfort, the mushrooms told him that his purpose in coming to this training was to provide support for me during my trip. And I would need it. On my medicine day, my nerves had mostly settled because I'd had two days of getting to know these really wonderful people and I trusted that they had my back. So I consumed five grams of dried mushrooms all at once on an empty stomach, what they call a heroic dose. And the best way I can describe the feeling that washed over me was an emotional flu. It was physically and emotionally miserable. Only I couldn't separate the physical pain from the emotional pain. They were one and the same. Psychedelic medicines tend to be intensely somatic experiences of the body, somatic. And one way to describe their mechanism of action is that they produce profound awareness of our physicality, nearly forcing our consciousness down into the body. And as trauma expert Bessel van der Kolk says, the body keeps the score. Trauma is stored in our body, and our minds do all they can to move away from the pain that's stored there to keep us functioning. But as we say in the field of trauma therapy, you have to feel it to heal it. So psychedelics are sometimes referred to, referred to as nonspecific amplifiers, and they have the power to turn off our psychic pain defenses and let the pain up and out. So at its core, psychedelic therapy could really be thought of as a somatic therapy. So here I am in my emotional flu, and I kept getting up and going to the bathroom. But really, I was just so uncomfortable that I needed to get out of that room, the container, as they call it. And that really is the perfect term for it. Because part of what makes psychedelics therapeutic is the requirement to stay in the room to stay with the experience, no matter where the experience takes you. Participants are supplied with eye masks to facilitate an inward journey, and music playlists are carefully curated to evoke emotional movement and to provide an anchor for the experience. And when consuming these drugs you know, recreationally, the thing to do is to go to a music festival or run around naked in the woods. And while these activities can be pleasurable and even profound and healing, the urge to move away from discomfort in these settings is very easily satisfied. And so the con in the container of a therapeutic setting, it's much more likely that if there are psychic wounds to be tended to, that they will be. So Matthew never left my side. I sat outside of the container in the sunny hallway and tried to explain my distress to him. But every time I looked at Matthew, all I could see in his face was anxiety and worry and embarrassment. I was convinced he did not want to be there with me and that my upset was making him extremely uncomfortable. Eventually, Matthew said to me softly, hey, I think what you need is a release. And I think that release is tears. And I coldly said back to him, I know, but I just can't do that here. So it had been several hours since eating the mushrooms and the medicine finally started to loosen its grip. And one of the facilitators, a bright and colorful, warm spirited hippie, offered me a mama bear hug. She knew I needed it. And she again suggested that I go back into the room, lie down, rest. And that finally felt like my body, it felt like what my body actually wanted to do. 
<clears throat> so as I lay down again, I was exhausted, but I was no longer writhing in pain and therefore no longer resisting. What felt like viscous tears began to leak out of my eyes. And I clutched onto Matthew's hand and began to moan as the tears flowed. The magic mushrooms took my imagination over. And in my mind's eye, my mother appeared. And she was imprisoned in a dark dungeon, reaching through the bars, screaming, desperately trying to get to her child. And I looked beyond the bars and I saw myself as a three-year-old boy. And he was precious and innocent, priceless. My mother was desperate to hold him, to protect him, and to love him with every fiber of her heart. But he was being kept from her. And then I could see that the bars of the prison were constructed from the trauma she had suffered as the child of a severely alcoholic father. The bars were made of the lifelong depression she suffered as a result of that. And they were made of the overt ridicule and shame she endured as an overweight woman in this world. And the bars were made of the homophobic culture she was born into and the fundamentalist belief system she fell into as a teenager. She was heartbroken that she would never be allowed to love her gay son purely and with her whole heart. And with that vision, my mother's love for me was unlocked inside my own mind. And it filled every cell of my body with the purest and most overwhelming motherly self-love that I had been missing. If you'd have asked me before this, I would have told you that I knew my mother loved me, but I realized here that I could never feel it. And this in part due to her trauma and in part due to my own. So the tears continued to flow as I squeezed onto Matthew's arm. My body melted in relief while visions of love and community began to materialize in my mind. In a vision, I walked up the drive toward my house and my boyfriend and my dog emerged from inside to greet me and he was beaming and so was I. And inside my house were friends from my new community here back home in Michigan whom I'd been keeping at arm's length. People who, if I would just let them in, could become close friends. And these visions allowed me to see myself from outside myself, through the eyes of those who love me, transforming my idea of who I am. And this new perspective allowed me to feel that I am not disgusting, that I have so much love in my life right in front of me. So many people trying to get close to me, people who would comfort me if, if and when I needed it. So this was just last year. My mother died almost 10 years ago. And I'd come to learn that the phenomenon of mothers appearing to their children during psilocybin mushroom journeys is very common. We were encouraged by the staff to bring something meaningful to place on the ceremonial altar before the beginning of our journey. <clears throat> and without thinking much about it, I brought something, but I never even took it out of my bag. Back at the hotel after my medicine day, I pulled it out and it was a photo of my mother holding me as a baby. I'd completely forgotten that I packed it. So I was desperate to get home to my boyfriend, Will, but I had one more day of training, integration day. And I, I came to the facility that last day 
feeling like a prisoner who had just been let out of a dungeonous cell, not having seen sunlight for 35 years. And as exhilarating as that was, it was also nerve wracking. I worried that perhaps it had all just been a dream and that when I got home, parts of me would still feel distant and cold toward my boyfriend. This despite my longing to be reunited. It was a longing I had never felt for anyone before. On that last day of training, I was keenly aware that although the dungeon had been dark and scary and lonely, it had been home for so long. And I know my way around that dungeon. I could get to the bathroom with the lights off. It's comfortable. But moving forward, I'd have to choose to stay out of it. When feeling angry or rejected, stressed, insecure, worried, or overwhelmed, I'd have to remember this experience and choose to move away from isolating, secretive, compulsive, and compartmentalizing behaviors. So I was under no illusion that this would be the end of the pain or the struggle of life. These medicines are powerful tools, but they're not silver bullets. So I arrived home in Detroit and I heard Will park on the street in front of my house. And I walked out onto the porch to greet him and I felt the urge to smile at him. Something I had never done before. So I smiled, even though I knew he might find it alarming. <laughs> so he walked into the house and he said, is everything okay? And I fell into his arms and I began to cry. He asked if I was going to break up with him again. And I said, no, I'm not going to break up with you. Everything is more than okay. On the sofa, I lay on his chest and he held me as I cried. And I didn't leave his arms for 90 minutes. And for the first time in my entire life, physical affection felt good. Psychedelic therapy involves three stages. In the preparation stage, the participant sets intentions and cultivates a positive mindset to create a safe and trusting therapeutic container. Stage two is the psychedelic experience itself, which can be brought on not only by medicines like mushrooms and MDMA, but by other means like deep rhythmic breathing called holotropic breathwork or sweat lodges, things like that. During the experience, the participants' ordinary defenses and psychic patterns are loosened, allowing access to unconscious memories and emotions. The word psychedelic means mind manifest, or to reveal what's in the mind. Finally, stage three is integration, where the participant makes meaning from the embodied insights, which is the key for lasting change. Every moment of every day is a choice for me. It's a choice I have to meet myself with compassion and acceptance and move toward connection. And I still don't get it right every day. In fact, the process of writing and preparing for this presentation threw me squarely back into that dungeon. Only this time, the cell door wasn't locked. That's my story. Thanks for listening. Forever grateful, yes. Forever grateful, yes. To hear the birds at dawn. They're singing grateful. So very grateful to have lived at all.